Let me also begin by adding a note of thanks to the Bogic family for making reflection about the meaning of religious diversity central to Vanderbilt life. I'd also like to thank this remarkable crowd for coming so soon after springing forward and losing an hour of sleep. It may be that you might catch up on that hour during the course of this lecture. <laughs> what is the meaning of my neighbor's religious tradition for mine? In some form or other, that question has been taken up by Christian thinkers from the very beginnings of the Christian tradition. But over the last five decades or so, that question has generated a distinct subspecialty within Christian theology, variously called theology of religions, or more, more precisely, theology of religious pluralism. My lecture this evening fits within that terrain. Given that the reality of religious diversity is not new, why has there been a veritable explosion in the theological literature over these last five decades? Why does religious diversity command our attention to such an unprecedented extent? The answers are multiple, but chief among them must be that we live in a post-colonial moment in which most mainline Christians have been compelled to give up, albeit reluctantly, on the notion that the whole world can and will be converted to Christianity. You will remember that this last century was to have been the Christian century. The global missionary movement set out to win the world to Christ and in effect replace other religious traditions with Christianity, thereby answering the problem of religious diversity by erasing it. The failure of that colonial project has made it clear to most Christians that a world without enduring religious diversity is now unimaginable. Is it the demise of that colonial project together with a melancholy generated by that failure which leads Christian theolo theologians to begin talking about religious diversity by characterizing it as a problem for Christian theology? Might we come to think of religious diversity not as a problem, but as a source of profound promise for Christian life and theology? My sense is that it will take considerable theological labor and even a conversion of the heart before Christians can come to think of religious diversity as a positive good. My hope is that this lecture will make a small contribution to that conversion of head and heart. One particular organizing metaphor has set the terms for conversation and shaped the questions taken up by theologians working within this field for nearly four decades. The metaphor imagines religious life to be a venture in mountain climbing and takes the various religions to be paths up a mountain. That metaphor, in turn, generates a basic set of questions that has set the terms for conversation and debate for several decades. And that question is, are the various world religions paths up the same mountain? When we move from metaphor to concept, that question takes the following form. Are the different religions independent means for arriving at the same soteriological or saving end? Put simply, do the different religions all lead to healing because they all lead to God or ultimate reality? Noted philosophers and theologians have taken up a variety of answers to this question. Christian exclusivists say no. Only Jesus is the way to salvation, and so it follows that other religions cannot lead to God. <clears throat> Hence, there is only one path up the mountain. Christian inclusivists, on the other hand, offer a more nuanced answer. Persons from other religious traditions may in fact arrive at God, but only because Christ or the Holy Spirit is in some way at work in those traditions. On this vision, the religions are not really independent paths up to the religious summit, but are efficacious only because the reality that we know fully in Jesus the Christ is in some unknown or hidden way operative in other religious traditions. The trajectories that others choose are effective only because the Christ who is the way is somehow present in those trajectories. 
Pluralists, on the other hand, have answered the question affirmatively. The religions really are independently efficacious paths up the mountain. Arguably, the most influential of pluralist theologians is John Hick. He contends that the various religious traditions are soteriological vehicles. Soteriological, just for our purposes, is synonymous to salvation. Vehicles that generate salvation. And what does that mean for Hick? It means a movement from self-centeredness to reality-centeredness. Hick believes that all the major religious traditions make this transformation possible for their adherents. And no tradition accomplishes this work in such a markedly superior fashion that would justify that tradition's claim to be somehow superior to all the others. In other words, there's no one path that somehow gets to the top of that mountain faster or more effectively than any other. Hence, for Hick, all paths lead up to the summit and none more efficaciously or expediently than any other. What then are the various understandings of ultimate reality is found in the world's religious traditions? Hick claims that they are phenomenal manifestations of a noumenal real that always exceeds any and all our concepts about that reality. We can know only how the real or ultimate reality appears to us. We cannot know what the real is in itself. So Hick argues that ultimate reality is neither personal nor impersonal. It exceeds any concept we might form about it. This is not to say that the religions are wrong to imagine and conceptualize the ultimate reality as personal or impersonal, as the real does give itself to be experienced in these different ways. It is true that on their own terms, the religions are incompatible. That is to say, traditions that claim that ultimate reality is personal, a loving God, for example, really are in conflict with traditions that say that ultimate reality is more like an impersonal ground. But from Hick's pluralist perspective, each is right in what it affirms and wrong when it denies the conceptualities of other religious traditions. Appealing to the famous and ambiguous duck-rabbit picture that Wittgenstein made famous. Do you, do you folks know the duck-rabbit picture uh, where the, the beaks of the duck uh, looked at from one perspective are the ears of a rabbit? You can't see both pictures simultaneously, uh, but both are there to be found. Well, appealing, appealing to that image, as well as the wave-particle duality of light in physics, Hick claims that the major religions are right to commit themselves to particular ways in which they have experienced the real. But just as a culture that knows only rabbits would be wrong to contest any reading of the duck-rabbit picture, which insists that that picture depicts a duck, so too the religions err when they contest the experiences and insights of other traditions. We might well ask how John Hick can know that the various religions are, in fact, oriented to one and the same ultimate reality, despite the very different accounts that each religion gives about that ultimate reality. Hick's decisive claim here is that the major religious traditions all lead persons from narrow self-centeredness to reality-centeredness. So every tradition successfully generates saints, none better than any other. So I like to say, I'll see your Mother Teresa with my Mahatma Gandhi. You know. uh, for any saint that any particular tradition can come up with, another tradition can match it. And no tradition is better at saint-making than any other, and no tradition causes on, on balance more harm than any other. <clears throat> Every tradition, uh, therefore, does this work of transformation uh, in more or less equally efficacious ways. Now, although each tradition will likely depict the specific features of this transformation in different ways, generically speaking, they're all doing the same thing. Hence, on both the anthropological side and the theological side, Hick asserts that there is a deep underlying identity between traditions. 
they may not see themselves as up to the same basic project, and indeed, they are right to see difference on their own terms, but from Hicks' perspective, they really are up to the same thing. There is but one mountain to climb and one summit to reach. There is but one ultimate reality. Now, the trouble with Hicks' proposal is that he fails to offer a religiously deep motivation for interreligious dialogue. Why? Because religious traditions have nothing to learn about God, humanity, or salvation in and through dialogue. If every account of the, re of, of the real is equally true and equally false, because none are adequate to the nature of the real on sick, the real in itself, then the only reason for dialogue is neighborliness. We're not given reason to believe that anything ultimately is at stake in the different theologies available in the world's religious traditions. It's not as though a cumulative reading of the world's religious traditions might teach us more than we know than within our own traditions. Likewise, if the differences between the concrete accounts of human healing and well-being do not matter because they're all generically the same, we need not be religiously interested in the concrete disciplines and practices of other traditions. The Christian who partakes of the Eucharist is generically doing the same thing as the Buddhist who engages in Vipassana meditation or Zen. Right? They're all means of moving people from self-centeredness to reality-centeredness. Now, Hick is not saying that the Eucharist is Vipassana or that God is Buddha nature. He's too careful a thinker to make those mistakes, which implies that I, I'm claiming that he makes other ones. What Hick fails to do is to give us reasons to be seriously interested in the differences between Christian conceptions of God and Buddhist accounts of Buddha nature, because we might learn more about the real in and through such dialogue. On his account, there is nothing to learn because none of our concepts about ultimate reality arrive at ultimate reality. They are true, but only pragmatically so, just to the extent that they serve as adequate guides to religious practice. Might the concrete spiritual disciplines of another tradition enable us to encounter dimensions of ultimate reality that are not well accessed in our home tradition? Might we learn something about ultimate reality by way of Vipassana that we cannot from Eucharist alone or vice versa? Hick does not pose such questions because he cannot. His commitment to one utterly unknowable ultimate reality trumps the importance of diversity. There is but one ultimate reality and just one worthwhile religious end. The variations in the route up to the summit are not of any great import. Now, as my students know, I'm not the first to say that Hick's vision of pluralism is hardly pluralistic. In a striking and provocative argument that opens up dramatically new possibilities, the evangelical theologian Mark Heim argues that there is a profound point of agreement between the most conservative and the most liberal of Christian theologians. He contends that liberals and conservatives agree that there is at most one worthwhile religious goal or end. The disagreement comes elsewhere. Liberals assert that all traditions arrive at that single end, whereas conservatives believe that only Christianity provides access to that end. Here, Haim is talking about the shared assumptions of liberal and conservative Christians. Both camps agree that, and I quote, if two religions conflict, then at most one can be correct. Wishing to affirm Christianity, Christian exclusivists seek out conflicts and in each case affirm the error of the differing tradition. If your religion differs from mine, you must be wrong. Wishing not to attribute error to one religion against another, pluralists recognize difference but sever it from religious validity. They are convinced that when religions differ, the differences are only apparent 
because of the metaphorical and symbolic character of religious language. They're all real but irrelevant in attaining the one true end of religion. If you think your religion is a real alternative to mine, you must be wrong." Close quote. Do you see that secret agreement between liberals and conservatives? Only one end worth getting to. The only question is, does everybody get there or just me? Heim contends that neither camp takes difference seriously by entertaining the possibility that there might be multiple religious ends, many salvations in the plural. Heim persuasively shows that neither camp considers the possibility of more than one worthwhile religious end. Rather, it is a shared axiom for both camps that, quote, there could be no more than one. The axiom challenges religious believers to recognize that those of other faiths actually are, in all truly important respects, seeking, being shaped by, and eventually realizing the same religious end. All paths lead to the same goal. Now, one can freely acknowledge that the paths are truly different in many ways. They cover different ground, have different scenery, and perhaps require somewhat different skills. But in relation to what the paths are for and where they are going, no difference is conceivable." Close quote. Now, after demonstrating that both exclusivists and pluralists are profoundly impoverished in their approach to difference, Heim offers the most striking formulation of the mountain climbing metaphor. He argues that there is no good reason to suppose that there is only one religious mountain worth climbing. There might be many. He contends that we ought to understand the world's religions as paths up different mountains, very different mountains. So the religious terrain is mountainous and, here is the important claim that Haim, Haim makes, each of these mountains is worth climbing. I'm sorry, you know, sort of immediately the sort of scene from, you know, Sound of Music comes, you know, the climb every mountain. Right? Uh, <laughs> my students know I'm, I'm prone to break out into fits of silliness uh, and spontaneous and random singing. So, uh, maybe this will keep you awake. So yes, these are different mountains. They are worth climbing. They, are, they lead to different goods. The different religions, therefore, aim at different goals and different conceptions of human well-being. They are not merely different ways to the same goal, but different ways to different goals. But then the argument that there are different and valid religious goals, hence many mountains, imply that there is more than one ultimate reality? How many ultimate realities are there? Now, Heim could very well have taken the option that there are, in fact, many ultimate realities. But he does not take that option. Now, before I turn to the option that Haim ad advances, an option that I find compelling in many respects, I must point out that there are theologians who argue for what is called deep pluralism, as opposed to a superficial pluralism. And they argue that there are, in fact, many ultimate realities. The process theologian David Ray Griffin is the most important advocate of this deep pluralism, a position that Griffin first traces to the work of John Cobb. Griffin appeals to John Cobb's compelling claim that alongside all the errors and distortions that can be found in all our traditions, there are, quote, insights arising from profound thought and experience that are diverse modes of apprehending diverse aspects of the totality of reality." Close quote. Appealing to a technical distinction between creativity and God found in process metaphysics, Griffin argues that for Cobb there must be at least two religious ultimates. I should note here in passing that my Microsoft Word spell check function is rebelling as I type these words against the S in ultimates. Although it now allows me to talk of plural salvations, and the, it does not want to permit me a plurality of ultimates. 
I, sh I should say in advance that I agree with my spell checker and disagree with John Cobb and, and David Ray Griffin. The virtue of having, but the virtue of having two ultimate realities, Griffin notes, is that it permits us to recognize the difference between and the valid validity of both those traditions that insist upon a personal and loving reality, God, Allah, Ishvara, and Christ, and other traditions that insist that ultimate reality is Nirguna Brahman, Dharmakaya, Sunyata, emptiness. If you have more than one ultimate reality, you can have both these kinds of traditions being right, because there are two ultimate realities, and neither can be reduced to the other. As Griffin argues, quote, the two types of experience can be taken to be equally vertical if we think of them as experiences of different ultimates. Now, time will not permit me to engage the details of Cobb and Griffin's process visions, and you should be relieved about that. Griffin does, uh, Griffin does go on to show, uh, in fact, that there must be three ultimates in Cobb's vision, creativity, God, and the world. Griffin himself posits four. One ultimate, two ultimates, three ultimates. I mean, uh, I'm thinking of Count Count on Sesame Street. I think my daughter might be in the audience. So. I cannot here present a comprehensive engagement with and critique of John Cobb and Griffin. Instead, I will simply have to assert that the very idea of multiple ultimates strikes me as self-contradictory and runs up against the very idea of ultimacy. The virtue of a position of the sort art articulated by Cobb and Griffin is this. As I've noted, if traditions are oriented toward different ultimates, and these ultimates are real, then when traditions find themselves in disagreement, this disagreement becomes a possible resource rather than a contradiction. So if I say that God is loving, and you say that reality is emptiness, we may both be right. We may think that we are disagreeing, but we are not because we are both right. So on the virtue of their position is that we might be able to use their position to see how apparently contradictory claims might turn out upon further exploration to be complementary. We might be able to combine the insights of multiple religious tradition to generate a richer vision of reality than we are able to de derive from one religion alone. Now with Cobb and Griffin, I agree that there is a profound promise in the claim that the different religions enable us to get at, quote, diverse aspects of the totality of reality. However, against Cobb and Griffin, I would argue, as does Markheim and a host of other Christian theologians, that all we need to posit in order to allow for a real variety of religious goods is that the totality of reality has different aspects. We don't need to posit actual multiple ultimates. It would suffice to posit one ultimate reality with a diversity of aspects. And that, of course, is what is implied by any Trinitarian conception of ultimate reality. Markheim, Raymond Panikkar, Gavin de Costa, and a variety of Christian theologians have argued that Trinity is the natural way that Christian theology takes up the problem of religious diversity. For Christians, God is not an undifferentiated and blandly homogenous reality, but is in some sense characterized by differentiation. Mark Heim and these others contend the genuine differences between religions are grounded in Trinitarian difference. So different soteriological trajectories, different paths, engage different dimensions of the divine life. Because Christians do not regard God as a homogeneous simplicity, we can expect that different traditions may rightly be oriented to genuine distinctions internal to God's life. So beyond homogeneous singularity and irreducible diversity, there lies an alternate possibility that Christian theology finds in the Trinity. 
The divine life is neither an, an undifferentiated absolute nor a plurality of more or less loosely related multiple ultimates. Now, a variety of Trinitarian approaches have been tried over the last several decades, beginning with Panikkar's groundbreaking 1973 volume, Trinity and the Religious Experience of Man. What Panikkar and others do well is to show that different spiritualities can be authentic ways of being oriented to different dimensions of God's Trinitarian life. However, nearly all extant Trinitarian approaches, Mark Himes included, come with a variety of problems and difficulties. For the sake of brevity, I will simply list and enumerate six problems with most Trinitarian approaches to the question of religious diversity before outline, outlining my own approach. So these are, I think, six problems with most Trinitarian approaches to date. First, Christian theologians have typically taken up some fully formulated version of Christian Trinitarianism and then assigned to religious traditions certain pre-assigned slots within the Trinitarian economy. Other traditions are understood entirely on Christian theological terms, terms formulated before dialogue. So if you have a fully formulated social Trinitarianism, you just sort of, you have that tool ready to go, and then you just stick in other religions into, well, that gets to this part of the divine life and that other tradition to this one. And I find that problematic. Two, in most approaches to date, there is an insufficient appreciation for diversity within religious traditions. So, in most of these thinkers, the whole of Buddhism, for example, is said to approach one and the same dimension of God's Trinitarian life. Christian theologians have not recognized the deep internal diversities within religious traditions. Three, by failing to understand internal variations within religious traditions, whole traditions are reified as oriented toward different destination. In Mark Heim's case, these destinations are real, different, and exist even after death. So Buddhists really get to nirvana, and Christians really get to heaven. And these remain real destinations in the afterlife. That vision, too, I find problematic. All Buddhists are going to one place, all Christians to another. Uh, it's very tidy, too tidy. Many theologians, this is the fourth problem, err in significant ways by misinterpreting other religious traditions, especially Buddhism. Often this error comes, uh, is due to a desire to make traditions fit within a given Trinitarian scheme that is formulated prior to dialogue with other religious traditions. Such a danger is most pronounced when theologians want to put all impersonal conceptions of ultimate reality into a single basket and all personal conceptions of ultimate reality into another basket. What is inevitably lost to attention in such an approach are the deep, vigorous, and indeed millennia-long debates between Buddhists and Hindus. They both have impersonal ultimates, but they think they're in disagreement. And even the, there, there are also important debates between Buddhists about their different impersonal conceptions of ultimate reality. So Madhyamaka Buddhists have long insisted that sunyata, emptiness, is not the Upanishadic Brahman. Still sour are the arguments among Buddhists about just how to understand emptiness. The subtlety of these distinctions between and within traditions has largely been lost on most Christian theologians. A fifth problem, and, and this brings me to what strikes me as a, a deep uh, problem with all Trinitarian approaches to date. Christian theologians have not thought to let the insights of other traditions play a role in helping us to revise and deepen our understanding of the Trinity. Christian theologians rightly affirm that we can with confidence look for traces, vestigia trinitatis, or intimations of the Trinity in the world at large, 
But these traces, when found, are in the end not allowed to inform and revise our understandings of the Trinity. So we take our model to them, but they can't play with our model. This strikes me as another problem in how Trinitarian approaches have been deployed to date. Until today, of course. <laughs> the sixth and final problem with most Trinitarian accounts to, is, is this, and this will come as no surprise. It is the claim of Christian superiority. Only we have arrived at a Trinitarian vision, whereas other traditions, however legitimate, aim at only one dimension of the divine life, and so miss out on the plenitude of the divine life. So we do Trinity, they don't. Uh, and too bad for them. It does not occur to most Christian theologians that most Christian traditions and thinkers also miss out on the plenitude of God's Trinitarian life. To account for and overcome these limitations, I propose a provisional and heuristic philosophical Trinitarianism derived not just from Christian resources alone, but from Hindu, Christian, Buddhist trialogue. The philosophical Trinitarianism that I propose enjoys relatively wide applicability beyond the Christian context precisely because I have derived it from trialogue. My approach avoids some of the problems associated with extant Trinitarian approaches because it does not take some particular fully formulated and maximal Christian vision of the Trinity and then try to squeeze other religious traditions into that prefabricated vision. Nor does my approach assume that Christians securely know just what is entailed in asserting that God is Trinity. With other Trinitarian theologians before me, I agree that if ultimate reality is in some sense Trinitarian, then we would do well to expect that we would see traces of the Trinity in human experience and the structure of reality as such. What I wish to assert is that these other religious traditions might deepen and augment what Christians have come to know about God's Trinitarian life. I would like to argue for a philosophical threefold of ground, contingency, and relation. Ground, contingency, and relation. I should note that I think your brochure has the term slightly differently because I initially wanted to posit a threefold of mystery, contingency, and relation. But I've decided to revise my terms because I take all three of these terms to designate mysteries, ground, contingency, relation. By mystery here, when I talk about all three as mysteries, I refer not to what is entirely and completely unknowable in the way that John Hicks' real is absolutely unknowable. By mystery, I refer to a healing wonder that the mind can probe and plumb but cannot exhaust. For those of you who are interested in very technical philosophical uh, distinctions, I would say that Hicks' approach is Kantian, mine is apophatic, and I don't think the two are the same. <clears throat> My philosophical threefold names both dimensions of the divine life and also the very structure of reality as such. When these terms, these three terms are deployed, and I'll explain them, so don't worry, one speaks simultaneously about both God and the world. Although the connections between these three concepts and traditional Trinitarian formulations are not hard to miss, my focus here is not to establish their proper Christian credentials, but to show how these concepts both capture something integral about the nature of ultimate reality and how they are central to a variety of religious traditions. Although for the sake of simplicity, I will associate each of these terms with particular strands from Hindu, Christian, and Buddhist traditions, it is at the heart of my vision that each religious tradition will in some way register all three dimensions of this trinity, though not in equal and emphatic balance. Religious thinkers and traditions that are deeply committed to one of these three concept intuitions are likely to fail to appreciate what is celebrated in the remaining pair. Indeed, part of the tension across and within traditions is due to the way in which particular traditions and strands thereof 
fail to register or even deny the equal importance of all three of these concepts. So first, ground. What do I mean by ground? By ground, I refer to what Christians have typically referred to as the first person of the Trinity. I derive the term from Paul Tillich's language of God as the ground of being, with his added qualification that we would do well to remember that the ground is also an unfathomable abyss. Rather than begin by amplifying these Christian characterizations of God as ground, I turn to the Upanishads and to the Advaita Vedanta commentarial tradition as exemplified in the writing of the master teacher of that tradition, Shankara. In your program for the day, I have included a selection from the, from the Chandogya Upanishad and the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. The Chandogya Upanishad, if you'll take a look, names Brahman as Sat, being, the Sanskrit word for being, Sat. It argues that the whole world is but a transformation of Brahman understood as being. Just as clay pots, jars, cups, and the like are ultimately nothing but modifications of one lump of clay, so too the whole world is ultimately nothing but Brahman. Elsewhere, the Upanishads and Shankara also employ the image of sparks and flame to designate the non-duality. That's what the word Advaita means, non-duality of the world and Brahman. The human predicament, as understood by Shankara's reading of the Upanishads, is understood to be bondage to the fundamental ignorance of this non-duality of self and Brahman. When you and I take ourselves to be exhausted by our conventional, ordinary identities, our finite identities, as composed of caste, gender, stage of life, and the like, we inevitably feel ourselves to be vulnerable. From and out of that vulnerability, human beings become captive to craving, hatred, and delusion. Raga, Dvesha, and Moha, the three great poisons in the Advaita tradition. We crave and are addicted to what promises to complete us, and we are averse to what threatens us. The cumulative force of this competing push and pull generates profound disorientation that the tradition calls delusion, moha. Captive to these forces, we human beings perpetuate incalculable personal and social harm and are captive to the cycle of transmigration. Liberation from the cycle comes from the knowledge provided by the scripture that the self, Atman, is Brahman. That is the point made in the famous Mahavakya or great utterance from the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. And that too is given in your program. Now the shared goal of these metaphors, clay, pots, sparks from a flame, and still others, is to persuade human beings to detach themselves from conventional identities and to discover within themselves that which is eternal. Ultimately, the Upanishads, as read by Shankara, contend that Brahman is ineffable and beyond language and thought. It is imminent as ground, but transcendent as mystery. One can know that one is Brahman, but Brahman itself cannot be known. Though designated provisionally as being, it exceeds all name and form. It is the ground of of all that has name and form, but it, it exceeds all name and form even as it grounds them. Human beings are thus understood to be the ultimate luminous and unknowable mystery that no words can reach, not even the words ground or being. And that's why I'm mumbling about the, the term. I want to say mystery, but of course, as I've said, I think all three of these are mystery in a certain sense. Now, contingency. By contingency, I refer to the Jewish and Christian appreciation for the wonder that anything is at all and that all that is, is good. Hence the citation from the book of Genesis. God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. Contingency refers also to the conviction that each and every particular is what it is and has an intensity and singularity of value. 
just this arch of the eyebrow, just this particular curve of the face, just this chin and no other, just this Jewish carpenter who makes all the difference. Contingency also names the Jewish and Christian conviction that God plus world is more than God alone. By creating the world, God generates particular and concrete instantiations of value. If those who or tend to orient themselves to the mystery of ground sometimes tend to dismiss particularity as evanescent and fleeting by saying, for example, that I'm not my body, I'm not my mind, right? By dismissing these things and focusing on ground, those who celebrate contingency insist that every particularity is a communicative expression of a good beyond being. Creation comes about through the logos of God and is itself an expression of the logos of God, the word of God. The God whose logos gives rise to the lovely world can be experienced as a lover who loves the lovely world into being. To acknowledge and celebrate contingency is to experience the ground not just as an impersonal or transpersonal absolute, but as a personal, creative, and communicative source, as the father and mother of the Logos. God speaks the world into being and sustains the world in being. The world itself is a Logos of God, the speech of God, and the self-giving of God. God gives God's self to the world by speaking the world into being and giving to the world the concrete, lovely and contingent need not have been but now is being. The human predicament when seen in the light of contingency is the failure of particular persons and communities to love and reverence God's lovely world and the giver of that world. Whereas ignorance of the non-duality of self and absolute ground is the shape of the human predicament in Advaita, the human predicament under the sign of contingency is a failure to love widely as well as particularly. The shape of this failure can be variegated, but we can say that the human predicament is marked by constricted selves who fail to love widely and with sufficient passion and intensity. Love is of insufficient breadth should it love only what is its own one's family alone, one's nation alone. Even the hypocrites do that. But love under the sign of contingency should not be misunderstood as a call to renounce particular loves. Without contingency, there is no possibility of the erotic. Shankara and the Advaita tradition call human beings to renounce particular and contingent loves for the sake of realizing non-duality realizing that you are Brahman. When one has realized non-duality and so is no longer captive to the narrow and constricted ego, a universal compassion takes its place. The calling of contingency is different. True, it too is a calling to move beyond constricted and egoistic selfhood that would use the loveliness of the world for gratification and self-soothing. But the calling of contingency is for a deeper and yes erotic appreciation for the loveliness of the world and the loveliness of the world's giver. The call is not to give up on particular loves but to expand one's range of particular loves without surrendering the call toward intensity which can only be fulfilled when we limit ourselves for the sake of reverence and piety to loving just this particular person or partner. Well, that's contingency. Now, relation. Relation names the truth that nothing whatsoever is what it is apart from its relation to everything else. To be is to be in relation. This is the Madhyamaka Buddhist truth of emptiness. To be more specific still, it's the Gelukpa reading of emptiness. To speak of emptiness is not, on this reading, to posit some impersonal world ground that lies underneath the world. Right? That is not what emptiness is. Emptiness, in this sense, is not Brahman. 
To say that everything is empty is to say that nothing whatsoever, not you, not me, not this table, not this lectern, not anything whatsoever, has a private essence, self-existence, or own being. Indeed, to be is to be no thing at all. If to be a thing is to have some self-existence that a thing enjoys apart from relationship. Nothing whatsoever is exempt from relation. More rigorously still, no being whatsoever, certainly not us, has some core or private essence that is non-relationally derived. Not even God, if God exists. To be is to be in relation. On this reading, emptiness is just another way of designating that all of reality is praditya samutpara, dependent co-arising. The human predicament under the sign of relation is understood as craving. Craving generated by the false idea that you and I are disconnected, non-relational selves. The ignorant notion that I am a self apart from you, apart from relation, generates in me a constricted and narrow ego self that imagines the world to be made up of things that I, the self, can grasp. There is something tragic comic about the human predicament so understood. When human beings take themselves to be disconnected and reified things, and take the world, likewise, to be composed of such entities, they are impelled toward grasping just those realities with which we are already intimately connected in and through relation. I seek to own you as a thing when I could discover that you and I are already bound up in utter intimacy. If I come to see that neither you nor I am a thing who grasps or a thing to be grasped, Buddhists share with Advaitins the sense that the ego is driven by craving, hatred, and delusion, but they differ rather radically about the cure to this ailment. The cure is not to discover that the true self is the world's ground, that's the Hindu view, but to discover that there is no self whatsoever apart from relation. All there is, is relation. There is no transworldly absolute up there or down there, according to Madhyamaka thinkers, at least the thinkers I have in mind. Positing such an absolute behind the world is to risk losing the world of relation, of dependent co -arising. Speaking here in my own stead rather than as a Madhyamaka thinker, I would argue that when the truth of relationality is obscured, then the coherence of reality is lost. Nothing holds together. Even our theologies are radically compromised. As a consequence, we risk accounts of God as an unrelated and immutable ultimate, a God who is being God when there is no world for which God can be God for. We make the mistake of supposing that the world is in some non-relational sense other than divinity, rather than merely distinct from divinity. Without relation, God and the world are marked not by internal relation, but external relation. God is understood to be what the world is not, and the world what God is not. And as a result, an irresolvable dualism emerges. The profound temptation that lies within every theology that forgets relation is that it might so personalize God that God becomes a being, a person who loves from without. Against this dualistic vision, stands a vision of God as spirit relation. The relation who is the love with which I love God. The one who prays in me with sighs and groans too deep for words. This depiction of the mysteries of ground, contingency, and relation, each derived from Hindu, Christian, and Buddhist traditions, is probably so brief as to be cryptic. Regardless of the brevity of this depiction, I hope that this account is sufficient to disclose several fundamental insights. I think first, John Hickey is right to assert 
that each of these traditions does aim to move persons from self-centeredness to reality-centeredness. Hicks right about that. However, because the nature of ultimate reality is understood differently in each tradition, the nature of the transformation that is called for is distinct in important ways. Both particular forms of Hindu and Buddhist traditions that I have described, for example, arose in monastic contexts and positive vision of ultimate reality that calls for detachment from particularity. The shape of these particular strands of Buddhism and Hinduism are markedly suspicious, albeit for different metaphysical reasons, of the erotic. If the erotic we, we mean not just sexual love, but intense love for the loveliness of concrete and particular realities. The texture and fruits of healing transformation in these different traditions are non-identical and may even generate real tensions in persons who are engaged in the practices of more than one tradition. But tension, and I've mapped out some tension, need not amount to incompatibility or contradiction. Both theological differences between ground, contingency, and relation and the way in which human beings are oriented distinctively to each reality can generate positive resources for interreligious collaboration. Now, I do not want to downplay the tensions between these spiritual trajectories. Those oriented towards the mystery of relation worry that an orientation to the mystery of ground alone might lead to world loss. If spiritual practitioners are too dedicated to a vision of the world of name and form, this world of experience as unreal, and so caught up in a sense of the hyper-reality of the transpersonal ground abyss, those practitioners may deny the realm of the face-to-face -face meeting, of encounter, of relation, and so fall prey to nihilism. This very danger is one that those oriented toward contingency can also appreciate, but in a different key. Those who celebrate the mystery of contingency worry that those who are oriented toward relation can miss the inexhaustible singularity of contingent and lovely particulars because lovers of relation are so intent on denying that particulars can come to be apart from relation. So it's good to ask and worry. Might not an orientation toward relationality risk the loss of the particular, and hence the possibility of the erotic, of love for the particular, not because I am not what I am without it, but because of the loveliness of the singular, with its own inviolable beauty to which I owe due piety. Having spoken of each of these three mysteries in isolation, I would like to assert, and I have no time to argue this out formally, that the tensions between spiritual life as it is lived out in relation to these three mysteries, do not amount to contradictions or incommensurability. To use the language of traditional Christian theology, theologians must strive to give an account of the perichoresis or the mutual interpenetration of these three mysteries. In truth, if reality and divinity bear this Trinitarian structure, if ground, contingency, and relation are distinct but not separate, to use the traditional language used of the Trinity, then one would expect that any, any robust and historically deep tradition is likely to find ways to orient persons to these three dimensions of the real, even if any given strand of a religious tradition is likely to err in one of these directions over the other two. So, for example, we find in a variety of Tibetan Buddhist traditions, thinkers who are worried that the Galukpa understanding of emptiness is too negative and cannot give an adequate account of our innate Buddha nature as a positive reality. Right? So, for example, Nyingma Buddhists want actually to say that we have a positive Buddha nature that is ground-like, a luminous ground of wisdom and compassion. When, when those Buddhists start talking ground talk, 
they start sounding a little Hindu. Right? This worries some other Buddhist because now those Buddhists, other Buddhists are sounding too Hindu. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, that resonance picks up in some Christian mystics who also like talking about God as a luminous ground of wisdom and compassion. This kind of internal difference within Tibetan Buddhism accounts for the long-standing debates between proponents of what the tradition calls self-emptiness as opposed to proponents of other emptiness. <clears throat> In the tension, debate, and ultimately efforts to synthesize these different com commitments, one can find in Buddhist traditions the motifs of ground and relation together with an appreciation for the suchness of each particular. Now, Christian traditions are by and large deeply committed to a vision of contingency. That's what we groove on. And so we tend to configure the ground not just as creativity, but as a personal creator who loves. Under the pressure of contingency, the ground is personalized and is experienced as lover. What happened to the rest of my lecture? <laughs> oh, good. And, and whether or not, it's just a couple of pages. <laughs> but there are many Christian theologians, right, who don't just groove to contingency, but uh, mystics, for example, who desire a unitive or non-dual experience of God. In such, think in such thinkers, the experience of God is ground and relation complements and sometimes even overwhelms a vision of God as loving creator of a contingent and lovely world. Figures like Marguerite Poet and Meister Eckhart come readily to mind. In both Jewish and Christian thinkers, we also find theologians of the spirit who experience and encounter God primarily not as ground or even as contingency, but under the sign of relation. To my mind, the Jewish thinker of relation par excellence, of course, is Martin Buber the thinker of the I-thou relation, the thinker of the event of meeting. A great deal of contemporary Christian theology, most especially process and feminist theologies, and a whole host of social Trinitarians are attempting to articulate more vigorously a theology of God as relation and reality as relatedness. For some process theologians, the vision of God as creator ex nihilo is rejected entirely for fear that this God of unilateral creative power is not through and through a God of relation. In my remarks about ultimate reality as ground, contingency, and relation, I have suggested that religious traditions, and now I want to add even strands and thinkers within them, are likely to be oriented toward one or the other of these mysteries at the expense of others. Where is the theologian or tradition that manages to see how these three are one. Thinkers and traditions have their particular genius and will typically find that they resonate with one or the other of these mysteries at the expense of the other two. Christians can take no great consolation in nor assert their religious superiority because they have come to see the validity of each of these dimensions of the divine life as named under the traditional symbols of God as Father, Son, and Spirit. The Trinity notwithstanding, Christian traditions have a long history of erring on the side of personalism under the weight of contingency, so much so that we have taken to burning thinkers and mystics like Marguerite Poret, who have longed for a unitive or non-dual experience of divinity captured by God as ground and relation. The characteristic spiritual distortion that comes from too narrow a focus on the experience of God as contingency, uncorrected by understandings of God as ground and relation, has been to figure God as an external and transcendent lawgiver who must be obeyed, thereby reducing religious life to ethics alone. Not surprisingly, Christianities of this sort typically reduce religious life to WWJD and cannot imagine a deeper desire to become the logos of God by the power of relation, or in more traditional language, to become the Christ by the power of the indwelling spirit. By appealing to a Trinitarianism of ground, contingency, and relation, 
I am arguing that the differences between religious traditions are likely to be important and far more than a matter of phenomenal cultural variation, as John Hick argues. I am arguing that the differences between traditions are rooted in genuine distinctions in the divine life. By arguing that religious traditions are oriented to real distinctions in the divine life, I am arguing that the differences matter and that the cumulative work of comparative theology and interreligious uh, difference, a dialogue, is religiously important. Put positively, if we are to understand how these mysteries might be marked by circumincessio or mutual interpenetration, we must take up interreligious dialogue. On my account, then, interreligious dialogue is not just motivated by approximate desire of peacemaking, but it's ultimately vital to the human quest for self-transcendence. We need each other to know more about God than we know alone. We cannot know how to move more fully into the life of the Trinitarian God apart from a deeper movement into a religiously serious communion with neighbors from other religious traditions. John Hick argues that the real is ultimately neither personal nor impersonal, and that all ways of experiencing the real fail to tell us anything about what ultimate reality is in itself. For Hick, we can learn nothing about what God is in God's self by way of our experiences of God. There is a sharp and irrevocable dichotomy between the one real and the various manifestations of that one real. All are equally true and all are equally false which to my mind means that they are all equally irrelevant. They become a matter of indifference. For Hick, the shape and texture of human lives as they move from self-centeredness to reality-centeredness is not a matter of deep interest. What matters is this generic turn to reality-centeredness. On my account, by contrast, the very particular texture of soteriological transformation matters. Christian agape is not the same thing as Buddhist karuna, which is not to say that one is superior to the other. How would we be able to tell that? My supposition is that we need both. If my Trinitarian account is right, there are particular forms of healing and human virtue that can come about only by engaging in the concrete practices and insights of particular traditions. However, these differences should not lead us to a vision of mutual indifference. My Trinitarian conviction gives me grounds for a certain holy envy for the particular beautiful, lovely excellences accomplished by Buddhist and Hindu forms of practice. My commitment to the mutual interpenetration of these three realities also rules out any eschatological vision in which different religious communities arrive at entirely different post-mortem eschatological destinations, some kind of divine condo complex somewhere, where Buddhists go to just one place and Hindus some other place. Uh, of course, inevitably, some of these condos are nicer than the others. And if it's a Christian theologian doing the thinking, you know who gets the top floor. It's, right? uh, the penthouse always goes to the Christians. <clears throat> Such a vision is problematic not least because traditions are marked by deep internal variegations. Religious goods do not sort themselves out one per tradition. Moreover, I contend that every theologian and tradition risks incompleteness, if not outright error, should they fail to attune themselves properly to each of these three dimensions of the divine life. The religious quest of our time cannot be imagined as one in which each religious community engages in the work of climbing its own mountain in relative isolation from other religious communities. Human life in our time does not work this way. Only by more deeply appreciating the distinctive goods of other religious traditions can we move more deeply into the divine life. There is no movement into the depth of the divine life without a movement toward our neighbors. And that is why religious diversity is not a problem, but is instead a source of deep 
and profound promise for our collective well-being. Thank you. Thank you, John. Let's, um, let's give John two questions from the audience here, and then, as I mentioned, we will rotate behind to have some um, more time to talk with John. So if there are two questions for Professor Tatanamo, one at a time would be fine. How about William Frankie? Where is he? That's, um, it's a great question, and I worried about that considerably um, as I wrote this. And part of my, and the question is, what is the status of these three words that I'm using, right? Ground, contingency, relation. I say that these are dimensions of the divine life, uh, but the words, I, 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 I say that's a kind of philosophical Trinitarianism. So am I doing philosophy here? Am I doing theology here? Am I doing both or neither? I don't know yet, <laughs> to be honest. I think that's a shrewd question. I don't think that a general philosophy that's not rooted somewhere in some concrete tradition is likely to get us to some kind of general view of the world. I'm not sure that a general view of the world that is not traditionally grounded is, is possible. So, um, nor are my words, these words, derived from nowhere. They're actually derived from concrete engagements with particular religious traditions. Um, and so they, they, they have an uncomfortable position as both philosophical and theological, neither philosophical and theological. Um, so I, I really don't know how to answer that shrewd question. Um, it's one of those things that, that uh, as I said, I didn't want to put the word mystery in, in my trinity, mystery, contingency, and relation, because as soon as the word mystery shows up, uh, you're squarely in a particular theological uh, tradition. Um, so I'm, I'm aware of the problem. I don't know how to escape it yet. I don't know if this is a terrible problem, though, to have. Uh, language is messy, life is deep, <laughs> and fertile thought is likely to be messy. And, uh, but I don't know that I can avoid the question either. I, I think it's a serious question. Yes. Since you're talking about Christianity is trying to fit everything into its mold, and, and it seems to be so firmly entrenched in that, such that, you know, how can, how can Christianity appreciate the diversity of, of what others have to offer? Uh, which is awful, right? I mean, um, it's partly to deal with that problem that I didn't want to use extremely Christian terms. I, I did not talk about Father, Son, and Spirit and move to another idiom in order to get away from traditional Christian Trinitarianism, in part because those terms um, are so familiar that we think we know what the terms mean. 
And, and part of my argument today was that whatever dimensions of the divine life those terms point to, it would be a mistake on our part, even as Christians, to think we know what we mean fully by those two terms. There are all kinds of apophatic reasons for making that claim, that we don't securely know what the meaning of these three are. The early Christian uh, theologians often said, uh, Augustine himself said, he who begins to count errors. So we don't even know what we mean, they say, when we say three, when we're talking about God. Because this is some kind of funny math that yields one plus one plus one still equals one, right? So <clears throat> there's always a profound reserve in the tradition, even about its own discourse. So uh, being aware of that, avoiding the risks of over-familiarity with Christian terms, I wanted to generate concepts that were vague in a helpful sense, vague in a philosophical, Persian sense, <clears throat> and then use those words which would have sufficient resonance for Christians so that Christians could still see that I'm doing something Christian, but have it sound distinct enough, different enough, to, uh, and rich enough, vague in a helpful sense, to capture the deep resonances of the Buddhist and Hindu traditions that I was also deploying today. So I don't know if that helps to answer uh, Professor Frankie and your question. You know, it, it, if some, this kind of thinking, this kind of comparative theology is going to take, it's, it's going to have to require crossing multiple religious boundaries. What language do you use for that, right? You can't use entirely the particular language of just Christians, because then Christians will quickly sort of slot people into camps and categories they already think they know. Well, I can't do that. So hence this move that is a kind of philosophical term, turn to, to philosophical terms, which are, of course, though, deeply resonant with particular ways of reading the Christian tradition. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, the, 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 the larger question of how to open Christians into this conversation is something I'm talking with my students all the time about, and it would take days to answer that question. Let's thank John one more time.